Welcome to the Most High Show, a show about recovery, spirituality, and the 12 steps. Produced, hosted, and posted by people in recovery who've been given strength and hope and want to share it with you. If you or someone you love is suffering, we want you to know you are not alone. This is the Most High Show. All right, hey, this is Dan Francis and Debbie Wood here on the Most High Show. Francis. <laughs> Well, she can use whatever name she likes because uh, we don't have any kids to try to chase around. But what we want to do is tell you guys a little bit about our recovery story. Um, we got into recovery about six years ago after a, a stint of really horrifying drug and alcohol use. I can speak for myself that I got into where I couldn't get drunk or high anymore. I would drink crazy amounts of alcohol, sometimes grain alcohol and uh, and it just wasn't working anymore and I finally got really desperate and one day I came home and my wife was gone yes I had left he um, I was on my own path of disaster um, I was using I, I was a, I, I enjoyed speed so whatever form of speed I could get I, I was doing and um, I just realized that I could not I I couldn't get to the bottom of my life while staying home with him and he I, I felt like I was being led to leave because he couldn't get to the bottom either we were both being that that person that was holding our drugs and alcohol together and I gotten really sick over the previous few months I've been in the hospital with pancreatitis and signs of liver kidney failure from alcohol and drug consumption and um, I wasn't ready to quit. I just wasn't ready. So she had left the house. I came home, and there was a there was a point in time where I was pretty happy that she was gone. I could do whatever I wanted. And the uh, the reality is that that lasted about ten minutes. And then I wanted her back, and I was really angry she was gone. So I started to text her a lot of really mean and pretty much abusive messages you know and i guess that was my loving kind way to say come home honey i love you but they were they were really horrifyingly bad messages and i i would not look at those messages i knew that when i left if i heard one more bad ugly thing out of him i that it was probably going to be over i was coming to my end i loved him very much i love him very much um but i knew if i stayed i wouldn't because the hate was and it was going both ways it wasn't just on him I was self-destructing myself in our our relationship as well but uh so when he sent me those messages I chose not to look at them at all um so but it you know I waited it out and it's it, they say it takes a thousand attaboys to to fix one or two what is the saying I don't remember one or two Eh, you did bad or wrong um, but he did he sent me those thousand I love you messages I think you, your mom comes into play yeah, here my mom does come into play point, I, yeah. I called my mom because grown men when they want to tell on their wives they call their mothers <laughs> and I called my mom and I and I said mom and I gave her about a half hour diatribe of how bad my wife was and how she was doing me wrong and I was perfect um, but she wasn't right. My mom just said back to me, well, I got two things to tell you. One is you're drunk and I don't want to talk to you. The second one is that you're wrong. Every single thing you said was wrong and that she disagreed with me. And then she told me if I could just do one thing and then if I could love Debbie, that she would come back if I could find a way to do that. And I, I really thought I could, but the, in the f next few days, I, I, made an effort to stay sober but the detox problems were horrifying and uh, I texted her some nice messages and then I didn't hear back so I, I decided to use drugs and alcohol again within a couple of days and uh, went on basically a two or three day blackout of sending those nasty messages again and um, a couple of my buddies stopped by the house to tell me goodbye they thought I was going to die from my drug and alcohol abuse I was looking very, very bad health-wise, and I probably was gonna die. I had a doctor tell me I had about 60 days to live at the current rate, and uh, I decided when the third visit from one of them came by, he decided that I needed to see some sort of seek some sort of recovery help. And after we almost got, you know, in a physical fight, I decided to go get some help, and that's where my story really changes. Um, you know, the great thing about rock bottom is that it's made of rock. 
and you can't go any further. There's just really nowhere else to go. And, and I was there and I'm so grateful for that. And I heard some things that night that absolutely changed my life. And for the very first time I, I had a feeling, I, I think I knew in my heart that God had come into my life and I was not going to be drinking or using drugs anymore. It was over, but Debbie was still gone. I didn't know where she was in the world. I knew that there was money and dope and I had no idea when or if she was coming coming back. No, but for as, as a turn of events, I did make my way back home. And my plan was not to stay home. It was to regroup. Uh, I did, he was not supposed to know that I came home, but my dogs gave me away. He found me there, and so I thought, okay, well, I'm stuck now And uh, for the moment because I really didn't have anywhere to go. I was running out of money. I was getting scared. And... Uh, he wanted he was grateful that I was home and he wanted to uh, talk so I said all right well I want to let's get away from here we had five or six dogs and it was kind of a crazy life there I said <laughs> let's get away from here and go somewhere where we can just be you and me so we decided to go to Panama City Beach for the weekend and uh, that's where I was still using and um, my drug of choice at the time was the the bath salts it was the the new the newest chemical that was yeah, coming out it was it was the equivalent of meth basically so and or was so uh, we go to Panama City Beach and um, we're just kind of talking back and forth and he's he's quit drinking for the time and um, he but he's really kind of agonizing over it that's his story um but i'm still fighting over whether uh, i'm still doing drugs and i know i need to quit but i'm still doing drugs well he goes to sleep this uh the first or second night he goes to sleep and i go out on the porch and i start talking to god and well god starts talking to me (laughs) and he kind of lets me know that i need i had a bunch of drugs with me and he said you need to wake him up and you need to give him those drugs So I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to. I argued with him, and I was very angry, and I yelled at him a little bit, and I said, I can't do that. I'm not, that's, no, I can't do that, because I've spent so long hiding it from him, even though he knew I was doing it. I still, you know, was hiding it from him. I would always stay one step ahead of him in my hiding. (laughs) He still knew I was doing it, but, um, so I woke him up, and I said, I've got to give this to you, and he was in a sleepy, like, what? What are you talking about? I said, you have to take this. You have to take this for me. God said what God spoke and I'm doing. So. Yeah. So she handed me a box full of drugs and I was 14 days into sobriety myself. (laughs) I opened it up and I looked at them and well, my heart started beating fast. I, I had a terrible detox. I was having seizures and lots of time loss. Um, so I was, you know, kind of sent me right back to that. I finally, after about holding in my hand and sitting still for about 35 or 40 minutes, God came to me and said, you need to get rid of these things. So I walked down to a dumpster out in front of, or up to the side of the hotel and I climbed in it because it's spring break and I didn't want anybody to find these things. So I start dumping it out and I'm making a lot of noise and I'm talking to myself because I'm kind of freaking out, you know? And uh, I look to my right and you ever stood in one of them square box dumpsters? Well, if you haven't, don't take the time to do it. The, uh, I stood in the, sit in the dumpster I looked to my right and there were two police officers about three feet from the dumpster talking and I thought oh my gosh this is not good Uh, I was facing a lot of trouble in my life at that time which we'll get to in just a second and the uh, the police officers just drove off I don't know how they couldn't have seen me but they didn't if they did see me they paid no attention and I was able to get rid of the drugs and our sober life actually started it did and and somewhere around there I, I told him I I've been a church person most of my life, younger life and, and stuff. I'd, I'd gone back and forth and back and forth and kept falling off the cliff. And But I did. I knew I needed to get back to God, so I did tell him, I said, I need you to find us a church, and I need you to be the spiritual leader for us. <laughs> yeah, spiritual leader. That made a lot of sense if you really wanted a poor experience. Uh, my first thought was, I'm done with steeples and stained glass. I don't want to do this. In fact, maybe maybe I'm not going to do this, you know. And so I spent a little time uh, talking to some friends about churches, and I heard about steeples and stained glass, and I, I spent time thinking about churches, and it occurred to me, there's this church I really don't like. And I bet if we go there, we can be out of there in 15 minutes. 
And I went back to her and I said, we'll go over here to this local church of ours. And I'm thinking this is gonna be perfect. This will settle the whole church thing little. once and for all. Little, it was not little, it was huge. And it made lots and lots of traffic for our area every Sunday when we would be trying to get to McDonald's with a hangover. Well, and so brief, yeah. We were so, very angry at this church. Yeah, it's capitalism. That's not religion. <laughs> that's capitalism. They're collecting tons of money. Anyway, the uh, we began a church life, but that wouldn't be it. You know, we went through a, a decent year, and it was a, a tense year or a tense six or seven months. And it would come to be that um, I would eventually go use again. And uh, in, in that process, you know, I just fell off. I didn't do the things that the world of recovery suggests that you do. I quit doing them. I had thoughts like, I've got this. All I need is, you know, spiritual music. I can read the books on my own. And it, it I fell off. And, and as did I. I just, I, there was things in my life that needed to come forward that I hadn't brought forward yet. they just skeletons in the closet that will keep, that, that will keep you you know, you wanting to use, no matter how good your life seems at the time. And I was tired of going off that cliff, but once again, I jumped off the cliff um, just for the six or seven months. And then yep. August 2012, 24th, 2012, for me, uh, my dog got run over by a car. That day I was, I was gonna quit. By me. Yes, he didn't mean to, um, no. but it did. And he was very angry that day when he pulled into the driveway and run over the dog. And I was devastated and I was very angry at God. And I yelled and screamed at God and told him how much I hated him and that I didn't care if I went to hell and I didn't care anymore about any of this life with him or for him or, you know, or even getting sober anymore, none of that. And um, in the meantime. Yeah, and uh, so I didn't have a driver's license. I was dealing with one of numerous DUI charges. I, I think that's what it was. I've been arrested a lot of times, so in my, my recollection of how they overlap and what one I might have been on probation or in a suspended license from at any given time, I'm not sure. But the, um, um, so I, I, I didn't have a driver's license, had no business driving. I ran over our dog, Coco Pop. She did survive, just so you know, she lived through it. And, uh, and I go hauling off to a vet and that's the last time we would see each other for a little while. But I didn't know that she lived. So I was very angry and, and it just, it was a moment for me to feel love from God. Cause when I did find out that she was okay, which it took her a long time to be okay. But, um, I've, I felt the love of God, the, the love of the universe, the love of whatever it is that makes you whole. I, I for the first time in my life, I felt that. Um, in the face of hate and anger towards this all power, this all knowing love. Um, so it would just be a little bit longer for me. I would, I would come along uh, maybe three months later. In the meantime, I'm under heavy scrutiny from the FBI, the DEA, Homeland Security, numerous other investigative agencies and from multiple states and jurisdictions and law enforcement groups of all kinds. And uh, I would be eventually indicted um, in a in a large uh, national takedown of the industry that I was in. And we would face a lot of challenges in the upcoming year. On December 8th, I decided to pick up a white chip after drinking a, a whole lot the night before and, and what I can only describe as a cunning, baffling and powerful moment where I thought I was fine and next thing I know, I'm uh, two thirds of the way through a handle of liquor again. Again, you know, I, I, did, I did not mean for that to happen. I didn't want it to happen. I didn't think I'm going to go get drunk. I had let go of the principles of recovery and, and I found myself just doing it. It's a, it seems to be a natural thing for me. And uh, from December 8th of 2012 myself, that's my s sober date. And, oh, and mine is uh, August 24th, 2012. That night I quit. I quit and I, I gave it all to the all-powerful love of my life and yeah so was, i was done and once we were finally done we had a marriage to rebuild there's no trust between us there was no it was a lot of tension between us a lot of resentment a lot of fear a lot of angst of of all sorts of natures and we had a lot of rebuilding to do and um all in the midst of a of a upcoming trial a, a really yeah rough one for and so i had been indicted on uh on uh uh three 
three count, three felony counts and included in an indictment that included 13 counts of money laundering. So I was facing, uh, the sentencing was gonna be 19 years and eight months in federal prison. And we had that to work through as well. So you can tell them what you were thinking about then. <laughs> okay, well, the that part of my life was really difficult and it was of my own making. And we go through a year of really working on our marriage and I would say the main thing we did was allow. The word allow comes up a lot. I allowed her to just have her moments and to not be perfect. And she allowed me mm -hmm. to be full of fear and full of anxiety. And through that, we began to build trust again. And over time, you know, things like sex and all that stuff, that was kind of like out the window, you know, that we were far off from that type of intimacy, but we would get there and it, it was worth, very much worth the work. Some of the things I think of then is that it's much less expensive to work it out with a person that you've already fell in love with once. And it's much more satisfying than the idea of trying to fall in love with somebody else some other way. And uh, really grateful for that time in our lives. But it was stressful. And there would come a day, uh, this is a ninth step story. I'm going to tell it real quick if that's okay. I get the ninth step. Um, and what happened was I... I needed to clean up my side of the street and meant, that meant to me I needed to plead uh, guilty and uh, that was a tough day I woke up on a Saturday morning and I was tired of the GBI and the FBI following me around I was tired of them knocking on the doors of my friends houses whenever I would leave and ask them why I was there anywhere I went anything I did there was a potential they were following me and I would often see them they weren't hiding they weren't trying for me to not see them precisely the opposite they wanted to make sure I saw them so I got up on a Saturday morning and I called my attorney in Lafayette, Louisiana, his name's Joe. And Joe and his law firm and all his people that work for him answered the phone himself. And he said, why are you calling? And I said, uh, I need to plead. And he said, "That's." I said, what are you doing in the office, Joe? And he said, I'm sitting here thinking about you. And it turned out he had talked to the prosecutor that morning. And instead of 20 years in prison, I was looking at five. I could do that. I could do that. And, uh, I, I went to Lafayette, Louisiana to plea so fast. I didn't bring underwear, you know. I like grabbed a pair of shorts and a pair of shoes or something thinking I packed and I left and I headed down there. And um, in an agreement to be in not really classes, but to be questioned by numerous different federal agencies so they could learn about how we formed a political action committee to represent uh, the bath salts and marijuana, fake pot drugs, the K2 and spice products that was successful enough to move it across the country. By, by being willing to do that, they were willing to honor this plea. And I would do that for a year and a half, sober, sober. And I tell you right now, the only way out of your past is to own it. There isn't another way. I, I looked for it, I wanted it. I craved it. I didn't want to leave this new relationship I was building with my wife. I didn't want to leave this new life that was coming about for me. I was so driven by my relationship with God. I couldn't imagine that I'd have to pay this price, you know, that somehow I'm entitled to this new life it was on my mind. But as the indifference of the federal government would be, they were uninterested in my new life. There was a price to pay and it was time for me to man up and pay it. So off to prison I would go. Well, and for me, during that same time, I, I once again got angry at God, but in a healthy way this time. I wrote both of them were healthy because they, they both had good outcomes. But I was to learn that, because I, I felt like had he had to pay that price the two or three years ahead before at when, when we did all this, that he then i could understand that we he'd be going to prison because we were just on the heels of doing all this bad stuff but this was two or three years later and we were doing good and he was so good for the community and helping other people and and i couldn't understand and what i i learned was that i could not have handled him and he may not have been able to handle it, but for me i couldn't handle him on the heels of being freshly sober him going away 
um, because during that two or three years, we got a lot of support, a lot of people that, that just rallied around us through different groups that we were involved with that were there for us. They, were, they, they just were there for me while he was gone. They were there for him and went and visited him. Yeah, and all that support we like today to call unmanageable grace. It's a depth of forgiveness and privilege we just did not deserve that goes far beyond the people that we could ever thank. Uh, we can thank so few of them for how many actually were involved. And uh, today, you know, what we have today or what we dedicate ourselves to today is service. Uh, I live, we live by a motto that the more important we make other people to us, the more important we'll become to other people. Mm. And that's our service motto. Um, you know, some of the other things we did to rebuild our marriage was we did a, a little bit of marriage therapy. She came to visit me every other week in prison. We stayed in touch and learned how to have intimacy from a distance uh, by talking about certain things on the phone, by making sure we kept up with each other in mm -hmm. certain ways, by reading the same book, same so we'd have things to talk about. And uh, and I got through it, and I, in the end, I served 21 months of a 42-month sentence. Grace, grace I did not deserve. Mm -hmm. I deserved for, on a charge that held me accountable for 250 tons mm -hmm. of Schedule One controlled substance. 250 tons. And... Um, to say they had every opportunity and every right according to laws of the United States of America to lock me up and throw away the key is just to state an obvious truth. But that's not what happened. So I did, in fact, get a lot of grace from the life of recovery. I did, in fact, get a lot of grace. We got a lot of grace from the ownership. And we got a lot of respect and kindness out of taking those steps that contributes to our marriage and today um i'll just bring it right back to today mm -hmm. uh, i just got back hurricane michael went through the florida panhandle approximately 10 days ago and uh, i had the privilege of going down and serving those people food because grace has given me a company that is successful beyond my wildest dreams and i had the time to do it so we went down and fed pasta to thousands of people in the Florida Panhandle. And people think it's me, but I know it's not me. I'm just a face on it. It's the movement of God in my life. It's numerous people that show up at the right place at the right time, strategically positioned to help God achieve His goals. I'm one of those people too. They didn't position themselves for me. We positioned ourselves together for Him. And it's so incredible how that goes the support and encouragement of my wife my business partner other people and wow you know the experiences of gratitude and humility in the face of disaster the place where tragedy was really really deep and i thought my story was something their stories are something else <laughs> and and what we learn what we learn when we don't have it is in the face of tragedy that the truth is really lived out and known and uh and we are here to tell you that. Yeah, and, and for me today, I am a mentor to other people that are going through troubles in their life. And um, that helps me every day when I'm able to walk other people through, a, through the same path that I've been through in the past and really see a change in other people um, to come about into whatever it is that's, they're, that's wrong with their life, whether they need sobriety or just to get away from whatever's going on in their head. So... It's, it's a good life today. It's a great life. And if I had anything to say to anybody, it would be to follow the steps of recovery. Do what other people have done. You absolutely can achieve with your spouse. You can rebuild the most broken of relationships. You can recover the most difficult of circumstances. You can get through things you don't believe you can get through. The fact is you are capable of something far greater than you are aware of. Mm -hmm. Something so incredible. It lies within you no matter how low you are, no matter how far you think you've gone. It is available to you in full without any discount at any point in time when you're ready to turn towards it and simply do the work as it's described to you in your world of recovery, whatever world that might be. And what we do today, we spend a lot of time with positive affirmation. What I do is I hold up Debbie as high as I can. Uh, as far as our relationship goes, the idea is that 
I make her more important to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm very important to her. And that is a formula for success as far as re you're recovering your relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're so glad to share thank our you. story. Yeah, thank you for letting us share our story. And we, our prayers are with you <laughs> and our thoughts are with you. And wherever you are in life, you know, reach your potential. Know that God loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you more than you could ever know. And there's something awesome waiting on you too, beyond your wildest dreams. Thanks. Thank you.